You know, I've been reading a lot of the financial publications recently, and the big headlines are, are we in a boom? Are we in a bubble? And, you know, I think it's a little bit of both, right? I mean, the economy right now is booming. We're in a big booming bull market, but some parts of the economy, some parts of the stock market are starting to look, and I'm going to use a really sophisticated economic term here, kind of bubblicious, right? <laughs> There's some overheating. I think that's what they say at the Penn Wharton School. I'm sure they use that as a, an economic term. Well, you know, we follow a, a very broad, diversified strategy. And you look at almost every sector of the U.S. economy, the U.S. stock market, markets all over the world. Um, most are in bull markets. And we've had bull market moves, but they're dwarfed by these parabolic moves in stocks like NVIDIA and Meta. Um, but that just shows you how difficult it is. You know, it's like, I, you know, I'll use a straw man here. You have a an investor decides tech's going to be the place to be this year. So they go out and buy Apple and Tesla and Google. And they're like, how come I'm not making any money? All I see are, you know, new highs in the market. So it's not as easy as it looks sometimes, guys. Well, you know, a lot of the questions I'm getting from our clients is, you know, it's, it's not like Chris go out and buy these things. It's like, do we at least own them in the portfolio? And of course the answer is yes. But, you know, it's kind of interesting, right? You sent out a chart this week that showed that as the price to earnings ratio, the PE ratio, as it gets higher and higher, you know, there's a there's a there's a connection between that and lesser returns. Yeah, no, it's exactly right, and I think that's where you're starting to see that bubblicious, you know, uh, sentiment in the market where all of a sudden you look at that those magnificent seven stocks and they trade at thirty times forward earnings, and then was like, well, it's justified, but is it really? <laughs> I mean, that's that's historically extremely high, and we know there's one thing you can learn from investing in markets is mean reversion is real, right? At some point. Everything reverts to the mean right now, and you're at a point right now where technology, AI, maybe it keeps going higher in the short term, but longer term, odds are you're going to have a magnificent correction because everything tends to go back to its average over time. It's kind of just like some, one of the laws of investing that seems to be true over and over again. Well, I think the way you look at it, guys, I mean, uh, you know, the beauty of having a big booming bull market and having parabolic moves in certain stocks, it's always good if you own them, right? So. You know, in our growth fund, we own the Magnificent Seven, plus we own Lilly, you know, the obesity with the obesity drug success. In our international portfolio, we own Novo with its obesity success. But, you know, investing is not that easy. It's not like, okay, I'm not going to go to the gym. I'm not going to eat healthy. I'm just going to stick myself with a needle once a day um, and, you know, just buy a couple of stocks and, and everything will be fine, right? There, there's going to be side effects, you know, if you don't go to the gym and eat healthy and, you know, just depend on a drug you know, keep your health. And the same thing as your portfolio, you know, if you just whittle it down to what's up the most recently, right, you're, you're buying high and you're going to ultimately buy, you're going to ultimately be selling low. Wow. That's an amazing metaphor. I know it was, it was, it was tortured, right? But I, I think I got my point across. No, we got <laughs> We use a Zembic as a, as a, as a, it's like taking a shortcut in investing. I love it. So good. So for all this time, I always thought investing was easy. So I think what you're saying, dad, is that if, if we go out and buy NVIDIA today, that's not really, the means for a good sound financial plan for the future. No, it's not. But you know what, Chris? I like to watch patterns, right? And and and, and especially like to watch the chart patterns of, of all the commodities, the markets, the bond markets. And you just look at the U.S. stock market right now. It is a classic bull market chart, right? We had a you know a magnificent bottom uh, over a year and a half ago in October of 2022. Big rally in the last summer. And then the market just collapsed right across the board. I mean, not a few things went down. Everything went down in a 10% normal average correction. And let me tell you, <laughs> at the bottom of that correction, everybody's hair is on fire. It's, you know, it's, uh, you know, they got Europe, we got regional conflicts, we've got inflation, they got an election coming up. There's no way the market can go up. And then boom, right on a dime, we turn straight up the all-time record highs, you know, now in, in this past week. So it's, you know, you look at, the market from 30,000 feet up and it's, it's easy. But when you're sitting, sitting there every day and you got to make those decisions, it is so hard for investors not to see past what happened yesterday or yeah. what happened on their statement. Well, it's short sightedness. And I think it's something you said, Bob, I think it was one of my favorite Bobism type lines is like, you know, bull markets get chased, right? They're not bought. And the reality of it is you have to be there before the move actually happens. And it's kind of like you have all these great opportunities hiding in plain sight right now, right? Yeah. I mean, who knew financials are at an all-time record high right now? Material stocks are at an all-time record high right now. You take a stock like Super Microcomputer, which I always said sounds like 
a shell company in a bond movie <laughs> that's up over 825 percent in the last 12 months that sounds a lot more exciting than getting you know something like over 20 percent in a value stock so you know i think right now the problem is just how myopic uh, investors get to your point, Bob. And the reality is right now, there's going to be a lot of big booming more markets over the next couple of years, but you want to buy them now ahead of time before they start moving. You know, there is that rule of scarcity um, and people, you know, reflect their, their view of scarcity in green eyes and jealousy, right? If you see someone making a killing in NVIDIA or Meta and it's like, oh, it's so obvious in hindsight, you know, you, you start thinking, oh, I've got to have a piece of that. And, and it gets you to do things that you wouldn't ordinarily do. Um, that's why I always say you don't want to be a market timer. You don't want to wait for the all clear signal that you get from these pundits, you know, the same ones that have been predicting this no show recession <laughs> for two years. Um, you want to invest based on your North star, your goals, your dreams, your needs, your values. It's so much easier, right? When you do it that way, like, why am I buying this bond? Cause I need that bond. You know, why am I buying, right. you know, stocks with a 11 PE ratio with a 4% dividend yield? Because I need those returns. You know, it's um, as opposed to, you know, oh, I want that shiny object because yeah. it's so much more fun at cocktail parties talking about shiny objects. Well, you know, it's kind of like that guy that drives a Lamborghini that everybody's so jealous of. But what you really don't know is that guy's 250000 in debt to own that car. <laughs> <laughs> I paid for my Lambo outright, Chris. I know what you're talking about. But no, Great I, car I to have in New York. You know, yeah. The other problem, too, is is like a Lamborghini, uh, you can be driving that down the highway and sometimes it spins out of control. And I think what people don't realize or investors don't realize right now is when these bubbles burst, they're horrific. I mean, take NVIDIA, people forget two years ago, that stock went down 50%. Mm -hmm. In fact, over the last 20 years, that stock has been down 50% or more on four occasions. After the tech bubble burst, it went down 80%. During the financial crisis, it went down over 70%. Uh, it was down over 30% in 2018. So, you know, these stocks can go down huge. They're not defensive. It's not a place to be. It's not a safe haven. And as we say all the time, it's just like no one's going to tell you when the music stops. You know, the one good rule of thumb you can use when investing is it's okay to be early. In fact, it's much better to be early because when you're late, man, you've missed the boat. and Your portfolio is down way bigger than you would have expected. Well, the whole thing is you, you also have to recognize the risk in the world. We have, you have gigantic geopolitical risk, right? We, you know, we haven't seen the price of oil go up. Uh, we keep an eye on that all the time because, you know, we have these regional conflicts that can continue to expand. We have an election coming up and, you know, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but our country is way divided and it looks like we're having a rematch of four years ago. And I'll tell you what, I don't want to go through another fall like we did before the last election. I mean, it's just insane what people think and what they do. Um, thank goodness, you know, for our charts and graphs that have shown people it doesn't matter, you know, who ends up sitting in the White House as long as someone's sitting there. But, you know, there, there's going to there's gonna be a lot of volatility coming up and you got to be prepared for it. Well, I'm going to pull my Rip Van Winkle impression. And I'm going to fall asleep right before the election and wake up the next day when somebody gets elected, when the market goes straight up. Probably not a bad strategy. <laughs> um, you know, the other thing I would mention here, too, is if you look at for the first time, ETFs have actually outpassed mutual funds and, and assets, something like over $13 trillion. But I started going through all these different ETFs out there. The vast majority of them are grossly overweighted to the magnificent seven in the top 10 holdings. So I think, you know, the other problem happening right now is these mega cap stocks are just creeping up inside everyone's portfolios and they don't even know it, whether you own the stocks outright. And Bobby, you went through this last week. I thought it was great. Just talking about during the tech bubble, uh, back in 99, 2000, how everyone just became more and more overweighted to those dot-com era stocks. Same thing's happening today. And I would guarantee most investors, most of you don't know that you have too much exposure there. And when you'll find out is when the bubble actually bursts. Yeah. I mean, that's a really good point. I mean, even the world's greatest investor, Warren Buffett, you know, his Berkshire Hathaway, the majority of that at this point, way overweighted in Apple. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, let's face it. He made a tremendous trade. Um, he also made a significant investment in Japan, which is in recession, you guys, right now. Japan is in recession, so the stock market must be getting killed over there. Oh, I'm sorry. It's at an all-time record high. <laughs> you know, it's, or it's recovering, a new recovery high. So, you know, it's, uh, it's sometimes it's really hard when you look at all the financial information, the fundamental information, and you say, ah, I got it all figured out. And the market does whatever it has to do to confound the majority of the opinion of the day. And it's going to do it every day for the rest of your life.
Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 152, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is what we do every day. But if you're thinking to yourself, I want a more hands-on approach, and you've saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, Bob, Chris, and I will run for your total financial master plan, and we'll do that with no obligation or cost. It's a full holistic review. We literally look at everything. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. We'll go as far as building you, your own personalized financial portal. We'll give you a bird's eye view of your entire financial life, and we'll hone in on every financial issue you need to address today, whether it's an income plan, when you finally do cross that retirement Rubicon. We'll look at how do you draw from your portfolios? How do you take Social Security? How do you build dynamic income plans so you don't run out of money, factoring in inflation? We're going to build that for you. We'll look at diversification. Has your portfolio been all over the place over the last two years or so? Has market's been extremely volatile? Or have you been sitting in cash? Paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do. We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll tie it to your goals. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products like annuities, mutual funds, brokerage products, structured products, We'll do a deep dive of every investment you own. We'll show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's not what you make. It's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you want this full review and you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's the tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E, having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And guys, with the thousand or so families that we advise at our firm, paying capital management, you know, one thing we found is for a lot of you, the hardest part is just procrastination. It's just like so hard to get the momentum going to address your financial issues that you just never get started. So I thought we'd talk today about some of the reasons why we procrastinate when it comes to our finances and some ways to overcome that and make sure that you get on your correct path to what I would call financial freedom or financial independence. Right. Didn't you just tell me the other day that Jim Cramer named his new dog NVIDIA? So, I mean, um, <laughs> I mean, if you're watching television, obviously you just got to listen to him, right? Bob, you know, it reminds me of that old saying, uh, often wrong, but never in doubt. I think that basically uh, exemplifies people on TV, the financial pundits, always certain about, hey, we're going to have a recession. We're going to have inflation. You should have all your money in tech. And usually it doesn't turn out the way that these very confident people predict, predict it. So it's kind of like, who do you trust? Right? I think that's one of the biggest issues is who do you trust when it comes to making decisions about your finances? Because there's just so many voices out there and they all seem so overwhelmingly confident. Well, you know what? I think the other problem is, is there's so many professionals in our industry that are out there just pushing a product. It's kind of like when you go to the doctor, the doctor's just giving you a prescription and not giving you an exam. Well, I think, you know, uh, truth be told, guys, and it's uh, you know red alert to the industry. Uh, they're all built the same way. You've got you know all these investment firms are financial product factories, right? They produce a product, they hire a sales force called financial professionals to distribute that product, you know, to anybody and anyone who will listen, right? That's why there's no fiduciary rule in the industry, right? You don't have to worry about that. And it gets scary because if you're getting close to retirement. And maybe the person you're working with has just been selling your product for many years. And maybe you have a nice personal relationship with that person, but they're not actually dealing with the financial planning issues you need. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons we have inertia is because a lot of us are afraid to confront our current financial professional because of the relationship, even though we know we're not getting the advice that we should especially if we're getting close to retirement or drawing from our portfolio. Well, I can really identify with that. You know, Dad, I, I'm feeling really stressed because my financial advisor is my brother, and I'm not sure he has my best interests in mind. <laughs> you know what, Chris? I'm sorry, man. I'm too busy driving my Lambo uh, around town that I can actually look at your portfolio. So you know, Chris, I'm feeling look. the same thing to you that he does to me. He keeps moving the goalposts and saying, like, you know, you, you're <laughs> almost there. You just got to put in another five years, and I think you're, I think you're going to be fine, right? Um, but... <laughs> <laughs> you know what, guys, it sounds like to me is what you're saying is like chicken and egg, right? It's like the, most of the industry puts the egg first, not the chicken. And, and I think for anyone listening to this, you just have to know what your plan is. What's your financial plan? What are, your, what are your needs? So instead of 
looking at the, the egg, basically look where you want to be, work backwards, and make sure your professional provides you the vehicles that will drive the returns you need. I know we literally have an industry where it's like, okay, here's some investments to put in your portfolio. And then it's like, you don't turn the GPS on at all. You just start walking and hope you're going in the right direction. That's crazy, but that's how our industry does it. Whereas with a GPS, right? You put in all the coordinates first. You put the location of where you want to go. And it's the same thing here is like, sit down, start thinking about like, what date do I want to be financially independent, right? How much money am I going to need at that time? What, what am I going to spend money on? Paint that picture. Then you go back, you, then you calculate where, what you need to do, or in this case, you know, what investments you need, what investments you don't need. But it just makes everything so much clearer when you finally articulate what your goals are. And most of us don't have the opportunity to do that. It's so key to sit down and do that. And that's the difference between working with a good financial professional and a really bad one. Yeah, right. Not only that, but also it's not like you just set, look at the GPS once, you know, you got to look at it all throughout your life. You know, you got to look at that financial plan every year because, you know, we all know things change. What happens? You get off course a little bit, Chris, and you're going across the North <laughs> Atlantic. <laughs> Can anything go wrong? You know, I, I did hit a, I did hit a reef recently with my boat because I wasn't following my GPS. So, you know, lesson <laughs> learned. True. That's a great advertisement for your, your services, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, the other thing I hear a lot is I'm just too busy and I, you know, I just can't get to it. Um, Chris, that sounds more like what you hear all the time is, uh, I have to put together a budget. What? But you know, it's, I think that, that that's pretty, that could be pretty intimidating because most people don't want to face what their budget is. Well, I think the other part of it is it's just so daunting when you don't know where everything is, right? Maybe a 401k over here from an old job. Maybe you have a retirement account with Morgan Stanley over here. You have a savings account, the local bank over here. And it's just like, you don't even know what you have. You don't know what you own. It's just like, it's overwhelming to figure out where it all is. But it's amazing. How many times have we done that financial audit for people? We tally up everything they have and like, oh my God, I didn't even know I was worth that much. <laughs> you know, like I never knew what my net worth was. So it's worth it to do that audit and start to break down everything you have and then figure out what do you do with it? How do you use all these assets you have to actually go cohesively get to a goal for yourself. I mean, to us, it's so simple. It's common sense. But, you know, you sit there when you're in the back of an envelope and you add up everything you have and you think, hey, I'm in great shape. I only take out 4%. What's the issue? Well, the issue is, number one, when you're taking money out of your retirement accounts, you're paying taxes. You didn't factor that in your back of the envelope calculation. And then you have inflation, right? If you don't know there's been inflation, um, you know, you must have been living under a rock, as you say, Rye, because when you take inflation against your your, your portfolio, you're not invested properly, you're not having the proper compounding, you're not going to reach those goals. And yes, this is all very overwhelming, but it becomes a lot less overwhelming once you articulate what your goals are. Um, we always joke about that too. Like we literally have a couch in our office so that we can perform fi financial therapy <laughs> <laughs> because it is just so helpful to walk through those goals with someone, start to paint that picture of someone or, or do it with your spouse, uh, do it together. But some way, somehow, that's really the first step. Once you do that, you can literally reverse engineer and you can solve all the other problems. But without that missing piece up front, that's the biggest mistake that everyone makes when they're trying to build their financial independence plan. All right, it's the hidden facts of finance. Random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, assets in passively managed mutual funds and ETFs surpassed those in actively managed mutual funds and ETFs for the first time in January. More people are indexing than using professional managers. You know, guys, I always said, I can't believe the mutual fund industry still exists. If it wasn't for the insurance companies, you know, using them in uh, their annuities and their insurance products or, you know, selling their 401k products, I don't think anybody in their right mind would invest in an investment where the fees are higher, the performance is non-existent, right? There's very few, if any, actively managed mutual funds that outperformed the underlying index, something we discovered, you know, 20 years ago. So the the idea that they finally surpassed in assets, no surprise here, right? I've been predicting it for a long time. Um, pretty soon, you're going to have the uh, mutual fund industry go the way of all the other uh, extinct animals on this planet. Well, Bob, you're as prophetic as always. So give us the next uh, big prediction for the future. For all years. Chris will be going on a vacation soon. <laughs> hey now. Yeah, as the sun rises in the east, I think that's what we can definitely bet on. 
All right, Chris. Novo Nordisk, the maker of Ozempic and Wagovi, has seen its stock market value soar to $560 billion, more than the entire GDP of Denmark, where the pharmaceutical maker is based. That's crazy. During 2023, the Danish economy expanded by 1.8%, with its pharma industry accounting for all of its growth, according to the nation's statistics office. That's a wild stat. Well, all I can say is, as the world gets skinny, the Danish stock market gets fat. Bob, had you invested $1,000 in Google shares at the August 2004 initial public offering, you'd have more than 55000 today. That would have been awesome to put all your money in Google back in August in 2004, 2004, 20 years ago, almost exactly. You know what's better than having a crystal ball in our industry? Having 2020 hindsight is so easy to pinpoint <laughs> the winners. You know what the shocking research that was just done out of the University of Arizona was that most companies that go public, like Google did, underperform, right? They, they underperform a T-bill. They, they don't even make a, a money market return. So the, the chances of you picking a winner like Google, you've got to be lucky. It's not about being smart. Hey, I'd rather be lucky than good. I can tell you that. Well, another great episode. Hope you enjoyed episode 152, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, please give us that five-star rating on Apple. Maybe leave a note beneath letting people know how great our podcast is. If this is on Spotify, you can subscribe. And if this is on YouTube right now, you can like this episode, subscribe to our channel, click that notification bell to be updated every week of all our new content. All your support gives us the ability to continue to do this podcast. That's it for this week. Stay loose and keep an open mind.